guys, this is Chris here, and today we're gonna to be answering a question. A question I get a lot. What do I do if my gun shoots low and left? It is an extremely common thing that happens to people when they are learning or trying to master marksmanship. It literally happens to everybody no matter how good you are. Even Jerry Michalek shoots low and left on occasion, although probably not often. Now, there's actually a lot of reasons this can happen, and we're gonna try to cover quite a few of them in this video today, but there's really only a couple of main ones that most people have to worry about. First off, let's talk about some of the things that you might be doing to make the gun shoot low and left, and then we'll discuss some of the things that maybe your gun is doing. Likely, it's you, it's hard to admit that, but the more you can self-diagnose yourself, the better marksman you're gonna be. Now, before we get into the video, I do wanna mention my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys very much. It's because of you, we have all this cool stuff to review, and we really appreciate it. If you like the channel and you think the information is valuable, make sure to go in the description below and sign up for Patreon. Also in that description is a link to a local shelter named Iowa. It's the YSS. Those kids could really use your help, so please go down there and donate to those kids. Now, what would cause a firearm to shoot low and left? Well, let's take a look first. So what we have here is my carry gun. This is my Smith & Wesson Shield Plus. This is how you get a proper grip on a firearm. So right here, we're meeting the web of our hand with the back of the gun, boom, like that. We wrap our grip around, right? We use the bottom fingers to control the grip. We lock the wrist out, and that helps the recoil control with our right hand. Then we take our trigger finger on and we go pew pew, right? But first, we have to add the left hand. So the left hand is what we like to call the recoil control device. So what it does is fit in the empty space that the right hand leaves. So we take our hand and we rock our hand in like that, and we build our grip onto each other with our thumbs pointing at the target. That's generally how you build a grip. Now, people differ for sure, and certainly they're gonna have a lot of different grips. My buddy Nick is way up there. But the same basics apply. Now, what happens when we do that is we create a little bit of opening space here. And what happens is, is the trigger runs on a fulcrum, right? So when we're pulling the trigger, what happens is the gun, even when you pull the trigger, it wants to go left a little bit because you're pushing your finger and you can see that we're twisting it off to the left already. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to fight that a little bit with your support hand, and your support hand is supposed to have a little bit more pressure than your dominant hand. So when we are shooting the gun, our trigger finger wants to push us left, and if you slap the trigger, it wants to push you low and left. That is one of the main reasons why people go low and left, right? Now, if you have an iron grip, you can really help out with that, and like Rob Latham says, if your grip's good, you can slap the trigger all day. So you can see there, I pull the trigger really hard and the gun is barely moving. And that's because I'm gripping really hard with my left hand. Now, if you have a good grip and you have a good trigger finger, you can eliminate an awful lot of that. And not only can you shoot accurate shots, but you can do them at speed. So as you can see here, now we'll add good trigger control. And even though it's a small gun and I have really big hands, the gun is not moving much and I'm pulling the trigger very rapid. So that's the first thing. Have a really good grip with your left hand. The second thing is gonna be having a good trigger finger and how you pull the trigger is up to you. There's a lot of really, really good shooters that pull the trigger with their finger all the way in the trigger guard like that. If that works for you, if that works for the length of your fingers, good. See that? There's a lot of good people that use the crook of their finger like that. There's even more that use the pad of their finger because they say that it has more nerve endings. Like that. All of them, surprisingly enough, work if you pull it all the way to the rear and you don't loosen your grip. And as long as the trigger goes to the rear, breaks, and that firing pin hits the back of that round without that gun deviating the sights, then you've hit your target. And the best way to figure out whether you've done that or not without ammo is just dry fire practice. So you have no ammo on the gun, you have no ammo near the gun, point it in a safe direction, you look at a light switch, and you pew pew all night until you can pull that trigger to the rear without moving those sights at all. Keep the sights in the sight picture, keep your front eye focused on that front sight, or you obscure it if you have a dot, and you just keep working on it. Now a dot will help you even more because not only a dot can use zero to make absolutely sure it's not your sights, but the dot will actually 
comet a little to the left or a little to the right if you're going low and left or lower to right and you can see really well if you're doing it or not. Now, the second thing I wanna talk about is anticipating recoil. So let's take this uh, CZP07 here because I wanna use uh, different size guns to uh, exemplify some things. So first off, with a double action gun, the reason why I got a double action gun when I was younger is to work on trigger control. So I don't have to rack the slide. If I wanna keep working the trigger, I can do so. And you can keep doing that same drill to worry about your left hand and worry about your trigger finger. Now, a lot of people do that drill, they'll go out to the range and they'll still be shooting low and left. And they have no idea why, because they're like, I watched the outlaw's video, I did what he said, this asshole lied to me, and I don't know what's going on. The second thing that can happen is anticipating recoil. So what we do is we have a good support hand, we have a good trigger finger, but right when you're about to break the round, you know there's a real round in there now, and now you know the gun's gonna kick back you a little bit, it's gonna make some noise, it's gonna be kinda scary. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna over tense our right hand, right? We're going to use 60% of our pressure with our left hand, 40% with our right hand, and at the very moment we break the trigger, we're gonna squeeze hard. And as soon as we squeeze hard, your right hand is gonna push your left out of the way and you're gonna dip that bitch low and left. And that is why we really have to work with live rounds as well. Dry fire is great, but it is not everything. So what we have to do is really focus on working with live rounds. We have to keep that left hand locked. We have to keep that trigger finger going to the rear without deviating the sights whatsoever. And at the very moment it's gonna break, you gotta really focus on not giving it any more hand than you already have. Your dick likes it, but your gun does not. So to recap, things you could be doing wrong, gun likes to go to the path of leaf resistance, and by the way, low and left just applies to right-handed shooters. 90% of shooters are right-handed. So 90% of you are gonna go low and left. 10% of you are gonna go low and right because you're, you're wrong-handed, and you're gonna go the opposite direction. The path of least resistance is just simply off the side of your dominant hand. Now, if you're shooting just low, that means luckily for you, you have a pretty decent grip. However, you're just pulling the trigger hard to the rear and you're slapping it down, boom, like that, and that's a little bit easier to fix. So low and left or low and right can easily be fixed depending on which hand that you are. Now, the anticipating recoil thing, that is difficult to master, I'll be honest. Many great shooters, I mean, that are much better than me still do it, and I do it all the time. Everybody says, oh, you're anticipating recoil. Well, you, the problem with anticipating recoil is you do have to anticipate some recoil or you won't have any good recoil control. So you need to find a good balance between controlling the gun, getting fast shots, and keeping your accuracy, and that's really gonna be up to you and your muscle memory. You're gonna have to be able to feel that in your muscles, you're gonna have to be able to feel that in your hands, and it's gonna be different for each gun because each gun is gonna have a different size grip, they're gonna have different different poundage on the trigger, and they're gonna have a different length of the trigger, which is why all the trigger placements are correct. It really depends on how short or how long the trigger reach is on your hand and on your firearm. Now let's talk a little bit about riding the trigger, okay? So one of the good habits that you can have with a semi-automatic pistol is gonna be riding the trigger to the return. So you don't wanna do this on a revolver, as a matter of fact, which is interesting, because uh, a little guy named Bill Wilson, uh, he used to be a competitive shooter back in the day, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's got an old company, I don't remember what it's called. He actually gets a lot of flack in comments because he shoots like that. Like he brings his trigger finger all the way off. And that's kind of a bad habit you get from revolvers. You wanna pop that trigger out with a revolver, but the semi-automatic pistol, you wanna ride the trigger. So when I'm shooting the gun, I wanna pull the trigger to the rear and then ride it all the way out, pull the trigger to the rear. And I don't wanna let my finger off that trigger. That way you can get faster return shots. One, two, nine. One, two, one. If you're having low and left issues, another thing that you can do, as I said before, you can find a gun with a bigger or smaller grip depending on your grip size. Now, I famously shoot low and left with SIG P365s. You can see there that the grip is extremely small. If you look at the pistol in my hand, it's not exactly meant for me. Now, if I pick up a 1911, I'm shooting straight all day. And the reason for that is because the trigger reach is exactly where I want it. I have long fingers, by the way. In a 1911, you can actually get longer trigger shoes so it can hit the pad of your finger where you like. But mostly, a 1911 has a very light and crisp single action trigger. So, there's just less for me to fight and less room for air. Now, let's talk a little bit about mechanical issues. Could it be your firearm? It certainly could be. 
some guns we've had on the channel, I think maybe like five out of 100 or so, come with sights that aren't sighted in from the factory. Now usually when those things take place, they're usually up and down, but sideways does happen. And you can actually check that by just looking at the space on either side of your rear sight to make sure that the sights are drifted correctly. And if you do have to drift them, it's not that difficult. First off, you can buy a sight punch from any of the major companies that you buy firearms from. And second off, a lot of companies when you buy sights just come with a little aluminum sight pusher that you can use if you want to. They do leave a little bit of marring on the side of your sight, but it is what it is, a gun's a tool, so who gives a shit? It also looks kind of cooler if it's been used anyway, and you didn't even have to shoot it, all you did was tap in some sights, and it already has that cool battle-worn look to it, just because you can't aim. Now, you can drift the sight either way, or what I would recommend, personally, getting a dot if you can. And the reason why I say that is because a dot will really help you self-diagnose that issue of going low and left or low and right. Because if you're shooting and the gun's going low and left, but the dot stays a dot, it doesn't comment one way or the other, well, you know all you have to do is re-zero the dot. And dots are so much easier to re-zero at particular distances than iron sights are. It's very difficult to take a set of fixed iron sights like this and push dovetail one way or the other, or sand one of the two off. If you're going high or low, you can sand off the upper or the front or the rear sight. However, most firearms these days do come with optics ready capability. And if you can afford that, it is a much simpler way to go as far as zeroing your pistol. And honestly, you can get a much more precise zero with a red dot as well. And you can also easier self-diagnose those issues we talked about earlier. That being said, it isn't gonna change your technique, so just by buying a red dot, are you gonna be automatically a better shooter? Absolutely not, but it will help you out. So that is just something to think about. If this video helped you out, let me know. I actually got asked this by a guy named Craig who did my MRI. I appreciate you, Craig. Thanks for the uh, video idea, and hopefully this helps you shoot a little bit better. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Please support our Oklahoma shelters, and remember to recycle. I'll check you later.